John Mulcahy, like all billionaire celebrities, has very <laughs> little presence on the internet, so I haven't met John before, so in, in researching him before, I, I could find out nothing about him. And even when I questioned him under duress earlier this morning, I found out very little more. So John, um, excuse my, the, the, the brevity of my introduction. John is a member of the Blarney Historical Association. He's a retired teacher. He's a local historian. And he has uh, worked a lot uh, uh, about, on the War of Independence. And he's a particular expert in the context of Cork City and County. And John, this morning, is going to talk to us uh, about the Cork Hunger Strike. So I'd like you to give a warm Kilmurray welcome to John Mulcahy. Thank you. Um, do you want me to mic up? The, the uh, all mics on there, can you? I, I was going to stand, but uh, I must say that John looks so comfortable that I'm going to uh, just take a seat, maybe, and uh, work away here. And I must say that it's it's actually very assuring for me to uh, follow on John because um, I think he's covered so much of the background that I can more or less go straight into my own presentation. And just, I suppose, to, uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, so we'll try without the mic, and if we get into trouble, um, we might change. I'm just, I'm just ready for emergency, I think. Prepare for the worst, I think, is the, <laughs> expect the best, but prepare for the worst. So I'm focusing on, the hunger strike in cocktail, and I'm going to do it basically on a day-by-day -day approach, uh, looking at the jail context first of all, the wider community aspect of it, and in a very, very small way, the international aspect of it, and John has covered that very well. And I'm going to go straight into it, because I think we've got on the background, and uh, I'm going to the yeah. Oh, no. it's, uh, yeah. Well, that seemed. Yeah. John pointed out that the background to the hunger strike was the escalation of violence that took place basically in Munster. Uh, between the, the later months of 1919 and uh, the, early, <coughs> the late summer of 1920. And there were a number of episodes, I just want to pick out three or four of them, I'm not going to cover the circumstances of everyone that was imprisoned, but we just pick out a couple of them as samples. One of the key ones was the, uh, the events in Fermoy on the 12th of September 1919, because it marked a a, a serious step up. First of all, it was an attack by the IRA on a presumably a soldier, quite a number of them. And secondly, it was very successful, and it introduced all the, I suppose, key points of guerrilla warfare. The surprise element, the speed, the timing, the planning. It resulted in the capture of a significant amount of weapons, but it also resulted in the death of one of the troops who uh, resisted, basically, I, I think I'm going to take this off because otherwise it's going to fall off. <laughs> uh, Private Jones. Now this led to uh, a huge military uh, intervention in Fermoy. Barracks was of course part of the town. And Fermoy was basically sacked that night. Uh, buildings attacked, uh, bars and shops uh, destroyed. But it also led to the number of uh, the arrest of a number of individuals, chief among them was Michael Fitzgerald, who was the actual commandant of the Fermoy, uh, the Fermoy Battalion. Uh, sorry, just <coughs> return. 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 So um, we do move on to Ratdorf, uh, 
place about halfway is between Cork and Mallow on the old Mallow Road. July 10th, 1920. Two policemen were going from the barracks. They were both armed. They were going from the barracks on Ratdorf to Bernard Village to the post office to collect the Daily Post. And again, they were ambushed. And again, it was speed, it was uh, coordination. Uh, a group of men uh, rushed out from behind the ditch, uh, grabbed the weapons, uh, shots were fired. Uh, the RIC sergeant, uh, Siri, uh, was badly wounded and indeed critical at the time. And again, it led to a huge armed raid on this small rural area and ultimately to the, the arrest of a number of people. Uh, it was interesting because it, uh, this is the first documented use of bloodhounds that I came across. And bloodhounds were brought in to, uh, to track the, 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 the ambushers and one of them was arrested, uh, McCarthy. But later that night, uh, a raid in the village resulted in the arrests of Joseph Kinney and uh, Michael, Michael Dewan. Michael, uh, you can see there, I can't, I can't actually see it, but it's the uh, RIC report. Uh, RIC kind of washing their hands saying, this was the soldiers now. And of course, it was very contentious because Mrs. Kinney uh, gave a sworn deposition that she actually saw the soldiers planting ammunition in a meal bag, which was later discovered. So it looked like uh, a complete setup. Now going on to uh, perhaps one of the biggest, um, well, for mine be the biggest, but one of the fiercest battles, gun battles that took place in the village of Valley Landers. The police raided looking for people who had been involved in an earlier attack in Emily, and uh, there were shots fired. A number of volunteers had um, gone into a house, barricaded themselves, they went up hiding in the attic, but they were captured. And they included three brothers, uh, three Crowleys, their father was the postmaster, he was arrested as well. And a number of others, uh, Michael O'Reilly, Christopher Upton, uh, Thomas Crawford, and, and so on. There was, there was quite a group of them from Belly Landers there. Uh, I've, uh, the next one here is um, Cork City. And a number of raids in the South Parish, uh, mainly the two Nolans, and I saw their numbers were uh, their names are up there on the uh, placket on, on the on the on the wall as two of those who initially joined the hunger strike but were later taken out. But also nearby, uh, a raid in the house of uh, this is Cornelius Murphy here, but just Timothy Murphy was the father's name, and the son Joe Murphy was arrested. So uh, and. Lastly, here, uh, I have one more here, as I said, I'm not going through every one of them. Uh, the British Army was going through uh, Ballingary, and on the road out to the Pass of Cayman E, something happened, the lorry, it broke down. Word got to the local volunteers, they went over, they held up, uh, whoever was on the lorry, British soldiers on the lorry, and they made off with the uh, equipment or whatever was on the lorry, paint and a whole lot of things like that, set fire to the lorry. Again, of course, now the, the uh, soldiers were treated to cups of tea in the village and then sent off on the road back to Inchigila. But of course, the re retaliation came pretty much immediately, and a number of local men were arrested, including a number of scholars that were in Kalash Namun in the Irish College there. And one of them was a young man from Limerick called Sean Hennessy that we'll be hearing more about. So, John has already said that. Uh, in early August, you, you know, Cork Prison was basically full to capacity of political prisoners, IRA prisoners, most of whom were uncharged, untried, and uh, looking, for, looking for their release. So the decision to sorry. go on hunger strike was taken, and the, sorry, let's keep doing this. And um, notice was given to the prison governor that, um, they were looking for immediate release. That was that was basically what was the bottom line. So it included um, John Hogan and Michael Fitzgerald, both of them uh, in for my, who had been held in prison without charge uh, for <coughs> almost 12 months. And this, I suppose, was one of the uh, one of the main focuses of the cause of the prisoners, the justification for the strike, that people were being held for a very very long time. No effort being made to charge him. The British, of course, would deny that. They said, we have made several attempts to charge him, but because we can't get witnesses. 
uh, British soldiers were rotated in and out, so many of those who had been involved in the ambush were now over in Palestine or uh, somewhere else. So the hunger strike began on the 11th of August. On the following day, you had the raid on the city hall. We won't go into the details of it. John has covered that very well. A couple of days later, the Lord Mayor was... Uh, everyone, everyone, of course, that was arrested in the city hall immediately went on hunger strike. <clears throat> and a couple of days later, the Lord Mayor was, was um, court-martialed. Uh, a kind of an interesting fact about it that uh, uh, hasn't been given a lot of attention was before he was uh, court-martialed, he was medically examined. And the doctors gave permission for the court-martial to go ahead, provided that it didn't last beyond two hours. And when the, uh, the court-martial uh, had been completed, when the uh, sentence had been promulgated, it had to go to General Strickland for approval. And he had to attest that the conditions imposed by the medical officers had been followed. So even at that stage, even though he was on hunger strike for uh, two days, uh, he, was, he was the subject of a medical examination. So there was a high awareness that things could change very, very quickly. And of course he gave the, the, the great statement that, I have decided I should be free alive or dead in a month, and I will take no food for the uh, period of my sentence. A month. That was what was foreseen at the time. As John said, Basically, no hunger strike had gone beyond three weeks. And I think that all of those in Cork expected to be set free. That is what had happened up to now. Uh, and that was the, the expectation. Um, yeah. Joe Kinney, um, who had been arrested uh, following the wrapped up raid, he was uh, an elderly man, 42 years of age, uh, quite. Um, quite more senior than most of those on the strike. Um, he was married uh, with seven children. Uh, he had been married in the USA, he'd come back from the USA. Uh, it was said at the time that he was an American citizen. Uh, there's no definite proof uh, of that. But nevertheless, he was associated with being an American and therefore maybe having a slightly diff different status, not the subject of the British Empire. Now, he had been in an earlier hunger strike and come off it, so he, he wasn't really fit to join in the beginning. But he wanted to join, and after a couple of days, uh, he did join. And it is said that Terence McSweeney, who, who, while he had been in the prison up to the time of his, um, up to the time of his trans uh, transportation or deportation, had tried to persuade him not to go on hunger strike. So, um, you had a situation, as John said, that the the authorities in the prison were faced with, if you like, a nightmare situation. And great work has been done here in the museum uh, to track down all those who are on hunger strike. And their names are below <coughs> and it totals 91. Now imagine that, 91 prisoners on hunger strike. It was going to paralyze the prison system. We talk in a moment now about, you know, how the different stages of hunger strike proceed. But it was a nightmare situation, so straight away, the authorities uh, gave instructions. Anyone that was, that was facing a minor charge, like possession of documents, <laughs> or maybe that there wasn't a plan in place to give a charge, they were going to be left off straight away. And that was the amazing thing that all those who had been arrested with the uh, Lord Mayor of the City Hall, who were chief leaders of the IRA not, uh, in County Cork, uh, were released straight away. A number of others were released, and others then were transferred <laughs> over a period of time to prisons in, uh, in Britain. Uh, quite a large transfer took place, I think, to um, Shrewsbury. So, on day six, um, it, it was announced that, the, that all those who had been involved in the City Hall arrest and a number of others were left off. Um, but already, uh, sorry, at this point the Lord Mayor was in the process of being transferred as well. It's believed that two of the hunger strikes in Cork Jail are already in a very grave state. Uh, the condition of others, very, use, very youthful, is such to render the possibility of court marshalling uh, impossible. Uh, there are no vacant beds in the jail hospital. Even with the release, even with the deportation, 
you were still at a crisis point in the prison. So I just want to say a few words about what happens when you go on hunger strike. And I suppose initially uh, it happens very fast. We all know what happens when we, we go off food. Uh, some of us might skip a meal um, occasionally and you feel the hunger pangs. Sometimes people, for one reason or another, will go on a 24 hour fast. And that's pretty severe. You do suffer, you know. But once you go beyond a couple of days, it gets much more serious. I suppose, first of all, the body uses up all the fat, the available fat. And when that is used up, it then proceeds to draw the fat from the internal organs, which has a serious effect on the functioning of the internal <coughs> organs, including the heart. And it slows down completely. So that within a couple of days, these people are basically inert. They're hardly able to stand, they're not able to walk, they're in bed, they're weak, their heart rate has slowed down, and their heart rate sometimes appears to stop completely. So that within a couple of days, there were already crises where people were feared to be on the point of death. It's the natural reaction of the body when it doesn't get the nutrition that it requires. A slowing down, but a slowing down that can sometimes appear to be almost death itself. <coughs> so from the war go, this was happening. There's obviously intense pain. There's obviously, um, it has a huge effect. One of the effects is sleeplessness. You can't sleep at night. And as it goes on and proceeds further on, you're talking then about uh, mental uh, effects, where you can be dis uh, disillusioned, uh, hallucinations, nightmares, all sorts of things. So it really is a horrible way to go. And we have to understand that it will be cropping up uh, in the reports that we'll be seeing as, as it proceeds through. <coughs> So by, um, by about the 10th day, by early August, it had reduced down. Out of the 91 names that are on the plaque below, it had reduced down to 11. And these were Michael Fitzgerald, who was the commandant of the 2nd Battalion, Cochrane Battalion Brigade for my battalion. So he had been arrested for, previously for a, uh, an attack on Arabian police barracks. He had done three months. He was barely out of prison when he was arrested again following the attack on the, uh, the troops in Fermoy. And now he was in, he was uh, the senior, uh, one of the senior officers in the prison. Uh, he was the senior officer now remaining on hunger strike. <laughs> Still pressing on them. Sean Hennessy was arrested in Tipperary. He was one of the youngest, he was 19 years of age, native of Limerick City, very involved in the Gaelic League. Um, he was going. He was giving uh, Irish language classes in the Limerick Technical School. So he would have spent a summer below in Ballingeary. Now there's no suggestion whatsoever uh, in any uh, place that he was involved on the attacks on the police bags. But nevertheless, he was rounded up and he was uh, put into country in a very competent and understood. Michael Burke from Folkestone Torless. Again, um, <coughs> arrested because of suspicion that he was involved in different activities in Tipperary and Limerick. Uh, he had been, um, I think, first of all, imprisoned in Limerick. And by all accounts, he was given a tough time of it. He was beaten up savagely. So he was carrying a number of significant injuries when he was brought to Cork. And he had these injuries when he went on hunger strike. John Power, Cashel to Ferreri. Um, he again had been arrested uh, on suspicion of various crimes in, in the Tipperary area. Tommy, Thomas Donovan from Emily, uh, again su suspected of being involved in the arrest or in the, um, the attack in, Bal in Bally Landers. <coughs> Michael O'Reilly from Bally Landers was arrested on that night. Christopher Upton, Upton the same working in the creamery in Belly Landers, 27 years of age. And of course, then you had the two, two Crowley brothers. Now, one of the Crowleys had already been deported. Their father, by the way, had been arrested as well, and was still in jail, in, in, in prison in Limerick. John was 27 years of age, was uh, a Limerick uh, footballer, played in the North Ireland uh, junior final. 
uh, working in the post office, his father's post office in Bellylanders. Uh, he was one of those arrested in, in, the, in, the, in the Crowley House, where, which was bombed to the ground, basically. Uh, he was taken with uh, his brother Peter to Cork. His brother Michael was deported in the, one of the first waves uh, of uh, deportees. And um, he, he, he was himself and his brother Peter, who was only 18, uh, was brought to Cork. And Peter was the youngest of the, the uh, prisoners on strike. And it says that the father of the prisoners, an aged man, was arrested, but released after some days' detention in Limerick. And I think it was more than a few days, we'll see later on. In the case of Joe Kenny, that we've already described, uh, he was 42, father of seven children. His wife was pregnant, expecting another one. Uh, come back from the USA and was living in, in, uh, Grena in Grena Village when he was arrested. He was the quartermaster of the, uh, the company uh, and he was also a member of the, um, the, rural, <coughs> sorry, the Rural District Council. John Murphy, born in Lynn, Massachusetts. Uh, the family came back to Cork. He had joined volunteers, been involved in a few of the, the, if you like, the lesser operations around the city and arrested at home, and they found uh, some pieces of explosive that his father went on to say that he had picked up on the shore at Ahada, which would have been close to the American um, base during World War I. So these were the 11 that uh, were on hunger strike, and now the focus was very much on them. Even though the, lo the Lord Mayor was getting the international attention, uh, the, the eyes of Cork and the eyes of Munster were on these 11 people. And there are now 12 days, this is, sorry, 14 days, and things are getting very serious. As I've explained, uh, they're literally prone. They're lapsing in and out of consciousness. The heartbeat is very, very weak. Uh, they're talking about Michael Bork uh, being among the more serious. We see as it goes on. This is fluctuating among them. One day there are fears for one group, fears for another group. Uh, they are being visited every day by their relatives. The press are waiting outside the prison gates to hear the accounts. So this is how we, we know about their condition. But of course there are also medical reports being sent up to the prison board in Dublin. Um, they just mentioned about Michael Burke and about the fact again that he had a number of serious injuries when he was brought into the prison. Uh, he had two weaknesses, and on one day he twice became unconscious for a considerable time. I think there's, there's a medical report that was sent up by and another one of the prisoners, John Power, where because it seemed that his heart had stopped, they gave him an injection of strychnine. Doesn't sound like <laughs> kind of medicine, but uh, that was in the official doctor's report. But anyway, there, there, there is huge concern about their health. And um, so he, we're now on to day 17. Uh, they're again in grave condition. So the, it's forecasting that a tragedy must inevitably ensue, ensue within the next few days. They mentioned Mrs. Hennessy uh, being in, uh, in, coming down to, from Limerick to the prison. And this is the first report now we have that there has been an attempt made surreptitiously to feed, give nourishment to the men through the water they were drinking. So uh, Mrs. Hennessy reports that uh, he was very exhausted, scarcely able to speak. He told her that the water given to the prisoners had been tampered with by the addition of some food substances. And if it should continue, the prisoners would refuse to take any drink whatsoever. And as John mentioned a while ago, a hunger and thirst strike would result in death pretty well within 24 hours. So it just shows the determination they had. They were resisting fiercely any attempt to, one way or the other, to try to give them any food or nutrition. Several, uh, the relatives of several other prisoners confirmed the statement, and some complained of thirst because they had already refused the water offered them on thirst night, knowing that it had been tampered with. So we now see that, oh yeah, just maybe the night for a moment freeze and go back. There were two, prison, two doctors in the prison. <coughs> But because of previous uh, hunger strikes and so on, from the word go, they said, we are having nothing to do with this. We are not going to interfere in the strike. Uh, that's it. The next stage then was that two doctors were brought down from the military prison, which would be above in the barracks. And they were in charge. So it's likely that these were the doctors that 
uh, were attempting to, to, to feed them. We mentioned about the groups of, you know, this, this was something I suppose that became obvious with the other uh, hunger strikes in other prisons and soon it was transferred to Cork. The groups of people gathered to prayer and initially it would have been outside the prison but the numbers grew so huge that as you can see here and this is only the 1st of September that the whole Grand Parade is filled. There are thousands of people there and this was to be a feature of the strike for the remaining time. The nightly rosaries, the gathering of people, uh, a huge, if you like, collective display, uh, almost religious intensity. In addition to that, the columns of the examiner were filled with reports of groups, organizations, uh, streets, uh, offering, offering masses. And I think of, you might be able to read them, but I'll just go through a few of them there. One of them was uh, the staff of the University College. Uh, the Masses on Sunday will be offered for the Lord Mayor at St. Francis Church the on, by the staff of Thompson's Bakery. Uh, in Blarney, the Mass was offered for the Lord Mayor. Uh, Coachford, there's another mention uh, of it there. And even the, the, the Ballyhooley Road and St. Luke's Cross we're organizing masses. Now this is one day. You can imagine, you know, spread out over, over weeks. Uh, you had these notices in the examiner every week. I think it was Bob Paisley who said that um, sport isn't a matter of life and death. It's much more serious than that. And I suppose to show how seriously it was being taken the Hunger Strike, the cock team refused to come out and play in the monster final. So we you know that's that's pretty serious. We've had a few a few strikes over the years, but uh, this is probably the first one all the GBA strike. <laughs> On day twenty, now this would be getting near the the limit, the historical limit of any previous hunger strike. Uh, it was reported that there were four on the point of date, and they had now gone twenty days without food. Michael Burke. Michael O'Reilly, Sean Hennessy, and Joe Kenny were the four. Um, so it's, it's ongoing the whole time how, how serious it is and how on the 27th day, that's a whole week on by, uh, the relatives were reporting that they could scarcely get any sleep and their changeable condition during the night had frequently alarmed the watchers at their bedside. And this is, a, this is an interesting point. The relatives were being allowed in to spend the night with them. There was a kind of a rota, as well as the day visits. And again, there was a strict limit on the numbers that could go in at any one time. But they were being allowed to spend the night. And as I said, the changes during the night, we mentioned one of the effects was the lack of sleep and so on, the disturbances and so on. Uh, this was causing great grief to the people who were doing the bedside vigil. Of course, it was also a disruption to family life. Mrs. Crowley had been in Cork for a week or more, whose husband had been, was, was still under arrest. She got a wire in the afternoon that Mr. Crowley had been released from Limerick Jail and noted that two of her sons were still on the run and a fifth is in Winchester prison. So that was the Crowley family and their involvement. <coughs> And now we have, there were, of course, a whole number of interventions, a whole number of people who um, were, uh, at this stage, seeking to release the prisoners. A lot of them, uh, a lot of the, the, the more prominent ones were in England, like the, trade, the various trade unions, the Trade Union Council, which we've been meeting around this time of year, even the Labour Party conference uh, passed the motion. But this is a, a rather obscure gentleman by the name of Harold Barry, uh, Philip Harold Barry. Uh, he was somewhere out in the Buffalo direction. He had been previously a high sheriff of County Cork, which I doubt would have got an awful lot of attention because, you know, this was maybe of significance to those of the Unionist persuasion, but not to the, the rank and file people of Cork. But he decided to intervene. And he sent a, a, a telegram to the Prime Minister uh, to Downing Street. I impress most strongly on you that there are 11 untried and unconvicted men dying in Cork jail. 
Even Mr. Bonner Law's letter, in answer to the Labour Party's appeal, doesn't attempt to justify the detention of untried men. Issues at stake far-reaching, inevitable result of delay disastrous, immediate reaction imperative. This was an appeal to Lloyd George. Now Lloyd George had been constantly peddling the idea that there was a majority of moderate people in Ireland, moderate nationalists in Ireland, who would be very amenable to a settlement on maybe dominion status lines. This was being, if you like, blown away not by the moderate nationals, nationalists, but by the unionists who were now siding with the 11 untried men on hunger strike. <coughs> so it rattled Lloyd George, and he decided that the government basically would have to go on the offensive from now on in a propaganda way. So immediately they started issuing reports and uh, leaking reports that these untried innocent men were in actual fact extremely dangerous criminals, most of whom were facing charges of attempted murder or murder. And this was being planted, if you like, on journalists and so on. Uh, one of those who, um, anyway, the, 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 the effect of Lloyd George, uh, as I said, he, he refused point blank, but he now uh, instructed the government to go on the counter-offensive with a black propaganda war. One of those who had made inquiries, mainly about the Lord Mayor, was, I suppose, the very fact that the Lord Mayor, you know, had a significance, was the King. And his, his uh, secretary had made an approach to the Home Secretary uh, asking about the prospects of the release of the Lord Mayor. And he got a fairly sharp answer back saying that the Irish office says that the, if the Lord Mayor of Cork was released, it would be necessary to release several prisoners in Cork jail who have been hunger striking as long as the Lord Mayor. These men were all charged with serious offences. Some of them were found with guns in their hands, hiding behind the hedge for the purpose of firing at the patrol. Now, even in the small number of cases that I showed up early, earlier, there was only one that fitted that criterion, hiding behind the hedge with guns. And this sparked a, a quite a furious reaction uh, from one person, but not, not for a, a, another few days. Now, another thing that happened around this time, uh, in the early weeks of September, the two prison officers in Cork are the two, the two um, officers that had, medical officers that had been sent down from the uh, barracks. Uh, they were being replaced. And it was decided by the Home Office because they were also interested in how long somebody could go on a hunger strike. Uh, no hunger strike had lasted longer than the 20 days. So they decided they'd send over two, two, two uh, doctors to Cork just to keep an, keep an eye on things. And uh, the examiner carried the report that they were going to, they were expected um, at the jail that evening. Uh, they couldn't find out whether they had been, whether they arrived or not, uh, but that they were being sent over by the government to watch the prisoners during the final stages of the struggle. So the, it, it's notes, it notes that they were still um, under the care of the prison doctors, of the, the military doctors, and that the chaplain, uh, Father Fitzgerald, there was a chaplain, and there was a, a deputy chaplain, Father Scannon, uh, in, the, in the prison, uh, mainly Father, Father Fitzgerald, but said that they were all in a very serious situation. So we're now entering, we're now, inter, uh, we're now in meeting two, two characters that were to be playing a significant role throughout the, the hunger strike. The two English doctors that were sent over by, from the Home Office. Uh, their names were Alan Pearson and Eric Batiscombe. And Eric, Eric Batiscombe uh, wrote to his superior uh, to tell him how he was received in Cork. I'd say it was a dramatic welcome he got to Cork because he got this letter. You have taken upon yourself the responsibility for the lives and deaths of 11 men on hunger strike in Cork jail. A responsibility which four doctors had already refused to accept. So the four doctors would be the two. Uh, prison uh, doctors and the military doctors. You are hereby notified that should any of the men die, either in jail or after release, as a result of the hunger strike, we will hold you guilty <coughs> of a crime punishable by death under the laws of the Republic. <coughs> this was a blatant death threat. 
do do anything to them that causes their death. We're going to get you. Welcome to Cork. <laughs> <laughs> they said, well, there's no point in, the, in Dublin Castle taking responsibility, you know? You're the people on the ground. So it's your responsibility. Pretty shaking. <clears throat> in the course of the same letter back to his, uh, his superiors, uh, Dr. Treadwell, who was the chief prison officer, the chief prison medical officer in the Home Office, he noted that the 11 men, of course, are in a dying condition after all that time, clearly, that the inn must be very close. Every hour in renders their state worse. They will certainly never give in, and from the medical aspect, the only possible way to save their lives is by their being released. I don't know whether you'd call that Stockholm Syndrome or not, but there seems to be almost an immediate empathy with the prisoners and saying, the only way we can solve this is by releasing them. As for the men themselves, I believe them to be past the stage of wishing to live. And this would be partly the effect of being without food for so long. They were <laughs> like going to whitening. And the priests and the nuns tell us that their only cry is, leave us alone and let us die in peace. It is really horrible. As a doctor, of course, this is completely going against the Hippocratic oath. You know, you're supposed to save lives. But by force of circumstances, they have to stand back. <laughs> Any attempt to interfere will result in thirst strike. Any attempt even to um, suggest to those in care, in, in care of the or those in the care of prisoners uh, would result in the same thing. So they just have to stand back, which is completely alien to uh, you know the, the tradition of, of medicine. Of course, we are not in attendance of them at all as doctors. They don't want us, and we can't do anything. We just act as lookers-on in case our services might be required. Now, they had immediately requested to be, they said, we can't do anything here, bring us back, we don't want to stay here. But they were instructed by the Home Office to, to actually, I think Dublin Castle even, uh, asked as well that they be, they be sent back to England. The Home Office said, no, you stay, you stay there. We dare not and cannot even advise the nuns, because if we did, the nuns would be sent away. And such little comfort as the men receive is entirely given by the nuns out of their own charity and experience. Now we are hearing, for the first time, about the four nursing sisters of the Bond Secure's Order, who had volunteered to come to the prison to, to take care of the men. Take care of the men insofar uh, as it stopped of giving them any medical uh, attention or any food. But they were the people who nursed them throughout, and they worked in 12 hour shifts. Uh, I, don't know the names. Uh, I presume that there they may be some record in the Bon Secure archives, but they played a very, very, very significant role over the coming weeks. <coughs> so, uh, this is an English journalist, Hugh Martin, a special correspondent uh, who came to Cork, who interviewed the, the two prison doctors in the presence of the prison governor. Um, and again, like, he was trying to paint the, the scene in, in the prison. The four nuns who have been in attendance for over a month in relays of two are now themselves approaching the point of collapse. This is having a huge effect on everyone involved in the strike. This is also Father Fitzgerald, the prison chaplain. The prison governor and the doctors are suffering seriously from sleeplessness and nervous strain. That's the, the position, if you like, inside in the hospital ward of the prison. He paints an amazing picture of the atmosphere in the prison as well. The prison is very strongly garrisoned, and well-armed troops, and with the most stringent precautions, are being taken against the admission of any unauthorized person and against surprise attack. Access to the interior can only be gained through a hedge of bayonets. And in the face of machine guns, constantly ready to fire at the word of command. This will give you some idea. And it's not just simply he, as a journalist, this is what the experience of every one of the visitors to the prison, every one of the relatives that they had to go through in order to get into, into the hospital as well. It was truly, uh, you know, a prison under siege. <coughs> Again, to show the effect it was having on the, on the, the overall community, Blarney Sports announced that 
they were cancelling their sports. This is, of course, the, the right hand now, the local, the local historian, uh, to log it back to a, a future date, and the subscription tickets will still hold good. Wrapped up sports, and they spelt out why they were cancelling the sports, because of the in inhuman treatment meted out to the Lord Mayor in Cork, and to the other political prisoners in British and Irish prisons. So it was a, bit, a widespread effect, and I'm sure uh, this is only just one example of, if you like, all social entertainment and everything was shutting down. The Bishop of Cork, uh, the much maligned uh, Daniel Collin, uh, was watching things and uh, came to the prison to visit them. Uh, we don't know whether he, he was putting uh, moral pressure on them or not. Uh, there wasn't any statement made afterwards, but uh, at least he was, he was showing an interest. And uh, he, he also went to Brixton and visited the Lord Mayor and photographed him here outside the gate of Brixton Prison. So the two, of course, are very closely linked together. And the two were constantly communicating with each other. The prisoners in Cork were sending uh, messages of encouragement to the Lord Mayor. The Lord Mayor in Brixton was sending messages of encouragement back to the prisoners in Cork. And I think this is very well uh, explained in, if, if you've been to the Cork Public Museum, uh, the display that they have in there on the two Lord Mayors and the Hunger Strike, they have a panel up just showing the interaction between the two. Another thing to bear in mind is the, um, the relatives. We spoke about them already. 35 days into the hunger strike, the same group are there uh, for several weeks. They were there all day yesterday, regardless of the rain. Uh, we would now be well into, um, into October. Um, well, late September anyway. And they're just sitting inside the gate of the prison, as you can barely see in the photograph there. Uh, numerous of it went in at their time for a visit, so there was a kind of a rota made out where there was never maybe more than two people in at any one time. Um, when they returned, they resumed their seats, and this went on until the curfew hour uh, approached. And we must remember now that following the shooting of uh, Gerard by Smith, uh, there was a six o'clock curfew. Everybody was supposed to be off the streets. So this is just again showing this atmosphere almost of suffocation that was permeated throughout the city. Uh, some of them spent the night, some of them were allowed in to spend the night, and some of them went off to the friends that uh, they were staying with. Because remember now, they were coming from all over Munster. Some of them were very long distances away from home. Uh, Joe Kenny was now uh, said to be extremely weak, one of those who was uh, concerned. Sean Hennessy, the youngest of the lot, again, he, he was constantly one of those supposed to be on the verge of death. And even, for, even at, at one stage, the doctors thought he was dead. This is again the effect on the heart of the prolonged lack of nourishment. And they will all complete the fifth week of their strike at three o'clock. So already now they were gone way beyond the bounds of really anything previous. And everyone was wondering and uh, amazed at really how long it had. Um, We've spoken already about communal, community masses. Now you have a general mass for the hunger strikers right across Cork City. And it was going to be on the first, second day, on the Wednesday. All city establishments are requested to close at quarter to 12. Now what was interesting about this is that the ad was placed by the OC Cork Number 1 Brigade IRA, which was a prescribed organisation. And it caused quite a bit of consternation as to whether or not they should prosecute the examiner. And there is a file uh, in queue about, uh, you know, will we go after them over this? But they decided not to. But again, you know, this is blanket across the city, shut down, closed down. And again, everyone focusing through prayer on the hunger strike. We mentioned uh, well ago about Lloyd George's um, instruction to uh, if you like, blacken the name of the, the people on strike. And as part of that, uh, Neville McCready, who was the um, OC uh, in charge of Ireland, the officer in command, had briefed American journalists, uh, telling them that the government had a strong case and that every, man, every case involved the taking of life. So the writer of this letter, uh, was outraged at this, um, if you like, 
taking away the presumption of innocence. You know, they were entitled to, to be charged, they were entitled to have a fair trial, but here you had some of the most serious people uh, in the country uh, <coughs> declaring that they were all guilty of murder or <coughs> attempted murder. It may go to the world that these heroes, the likes of whom have never been found in history, who are daily suffering agonies of death for the sake of their country, that these men are murderers. The man who wrote the letter was Father Carroll, who was a curate in Granat, County Cork. Obviously, we know very well one of the hunger strikers, Joe Kinney, whom he said he employed as a coachman from time to time. And he, uh, having, if you like, made a, a blanket statement initially that it is unprecedented for a government to come along and to say these things about people who have not had a trial, um, to kill and destroy their reputation and brand them as murderers. It is not thus the public will judge them, nor the ages to come. When the present government has gone and consigned to an ignoble grave in the modern Cromwell, uh, who can join with the crucifixion of a nation, the memory of those men uh, will live as the noblest, purest, soul heroes that the world has seen. Now he went on then, I, I, I'm going to move a little bit quicker now, but he was making the case for Joe Kenny that there was no way that Joe Kenny could have been involved in that ambush because people saw him leaving the village before it, he was at his sister's house in Cork, he attended a meeting of the poor law gardens and he went back home, lived in his house, was arrested in the middle of his family. How could that be a guilty person? So as I said, this man was a, a very, very strong advocate uh, for the character. Um, again, the doctors, 48 days at this stage now, um, they were still amazed that they were alive. And they were giving credit to the nuns. They said that only for the nuns, uh, they were, who, who kept, them, kept them moving on the bed, who uh, rubbed oil on, on, on their bodies, they would have suffered bed sores. And in their weakened state, it would have assist, assisted their death. So uh, the, the nuns were being given credit by the two doctors in the prison. Uh, just to give a general view there about the, the condition of them, I'm going to move, move a little bit faster now. But now that it's coming up, there are rumours circulating around. These people could not be lasting without food. They just couldn't be. They must be getting food somehow or other. It must be smuggled into them. So they, the prisoners themselves were disturbed in that, and they wanted a, an independent medical examination. But equally, the two prison doctors were adamant that there was no way that any food was being smuggled. And they were prepared to go on the record on that, to, to kind of uh, do away with this propaganda that is, is being thrown. So you can see, again, the, the gathering, the prayers at night. But this isn't the local paper, this is the Illustrated London News. So this is getting major, prominent yeah. um, coverage throughout the English-speaking world, as John pointed out. And, you know, things are now moving inevitably towards a debt. And the first date takes place on the 67th day, and that is Michael Fitzgerald. Like his fellow hunger strikers who still linger on, he faced death calmly and unflinchingly, and he has given up his life in vindication of a principle. <coughs> it is to be feared that his debt is the first of a series, and that the grim harvester will be busy in Cork Jail over the days to come. Now, John has already mentioned about uh, the poignancy of uh, his uh, attempted ma marriage with, with uh, Miss Conlon, Conlon sorry, and uh, the prison chaplain was uh, willing to, to, um, to marry them, but the governor said, uh, if you do, you're fired. And then there was uh, an arrangement made to bring him out, an outside priest, but again they were told, if that happens, um, there won't be any further visits. So, for Michael Fitzgerald, who had his ring under the pillow, was denied uh, his deathbed marriage. And again, you know, we can think about possibly the, the perception that would be there. But even so, the funeral of Michael Fitzgerald was a massive uh, public ceremony staged in Cork. And of course it had its drama because uh, when, he, when his body was removed to St. Peter and Paul's, uh, just before the funeral mass, uh, an, arm, an armed uh, troop marched up through the church and announced that there would be no public procession or display of flags or anything like that, uh, which shocked people, you know, that the sacredness of the church would be defiled in that way. 
But even so, then, uh, you still had an enormous crowd. And again, the photographs were um, put up. Uh, this is the removal of the coffin, and you can see there wasn't a flag in it. And the next one here shows the funeral in Patrick Street. And it shows vividly that, you know, the crowds in Cork, that they were hemmed in by armoured cars, by lorries of troops. Cork was a city under the occupation. Yeah. And of course, the funeral took place to Kilcrumper, to the Republican plot, and uh, where he's buried in the same grave as uh, Liam Lynch. Now, the mood is darkening. You know, if this was the first to die, there wouldn't be, it wouldn't be long before you were going to have more deaths and more funerals. We've looked already at the photograph of uh, Brixton and uh, the eyes of the world are, because of the international interest, the eyes of the world are much more focused now in Brixton. And of course, on the 74th day, the Lord Mayor dies. And uh, you can just see the, this is the, the local paper, the Echo, and the full page is covered. Irrespective of the fact that on the same day, another prisoner had died in Cork, and this was Joe Murphy. But that Joe Murphy's death was almost completely blanked by the coverage given to the Lord Mayor. Uh, again, uh, Joe Murphy uh, was living in Powell Duff Road, and he had done 74 days of hunger strike. And again, it's emphasised every time that they were, these were all given the rights of the church, that these were highly moral people, they were almost saints or martyrs. You get this impression. Even in even papers that were very anti, you know, the, the armed struggle, the, the IRA crusade, the, the, the Freeman's Journal, the Examiner perhaps to, to an extent, the Independent, they were all playing out the state scene. And um, the funeral of Joseph Fitzgerald probably was, or uh, Joseph Murphy was probably a bit more muted than Michael Fitzgerald, but nevertheless huge crowds turned out. Uh, the Lock Chapel, again you can see the, the armoured cars, the, the bayonets and so on and so forth, and the funeral route through Cox City. So, you have, we had already two funerals, and these were huge outpourings of public emotion, you know, and this was obviously a, a major strain on people, and yet this was only going to, the, if you like, the trial run for the biggest one of the lot, which was going to be the Lord Mayor's funeral. And, um, that's the Grand Parade. And of course, this is Paula Duff, uh, where, where he is. And the plaque was unveiled there in the 50s to him. As I said, the big funeral was going to be the Lord Mayor's. It was proclaimed as a day of national mourning. And Dolly Erdem asked that all businesses close and that it would be a solemn day of mourning, not just for the Lord Mayor, but also from, um, from Michael Fitzgerald and for Joe Murphy as well but basically the country was going to close down. We're familiar with the images of the Lord Mayor's funeral, the Lane Estate and the City Hall, the funeral throughout the streets of Cork. Massive, massive turnout. Again, hugely, hugely emotional. And people are saying, you know, how are we going to take any further funerals, any further deaths? And now everybody is focusing on trying to find a way to end the strike. But how can you do that? Because the prisoners are just so committed. You know, it's become, they've, they've gone past, they may not even survive. So why should they give it up for a principle? And the British were not going to change it, show that uh, by, by letting three die already. So people are now trying to think, can, is it possible to find a way? On day 90, the bishop, Carl, uh, again went to the prison and tried to intercede with them to, uh, to give up the strike. But he wasn't very successful, it's not surprising, given the public statement that he made after it. Uh, he, uh, um, the paper says that they are bearing their appearing trial with heroic fortitude, and the relatives outside the gate of the prison where they've spent day after day for three months, they are also showing heroic quality of endurance that has distinguished the struggle of the untried prisoners. The, the bishop, in, in his letter, uh, said that um, the, the continuance of the hunger strike will only lead to a waste of human life. The morale of the nation can be maintained without a useless, useless sacrifice. Now that's, you know, pretty unsympathetic. 
It should be ended at once. That's it. I'm the bishop. Finish it. And it did not have much effect. And something much more subtle was going to be required. And the man who provided the key is almost, you know, unheard of. Uh, his name was Father Timothy O'Leary. He was uh, the, the South, attached to the South Chapel. He'd be remembered today by the Father O'Leary Hall in Bandon Road. And he decided he would, was going to try to do something. And he prefaced his, uh, his note uh, by saying that he had consulted the Sinn Féin priests in the Cork Diocese. Now, I don't think there was any way that Daniel Collin would have consulted the Sinn Féin priests. <laughs> He'd probably have been surprised that there were any of them in his diocese. But he made the point that the continued hunger strike wasn't going to achieve that. That if you like, the high point had been reached with the death of the Lord Mayor and the other two, and that nothing was going to be gained. Therefore, these people were going to die in vain. And that, he said, there is a danger that this will affect public opinion in the completely opposite way, that the lives of the 11 more would be sacrificed for something that couldn't be achieved. So he put the case strongly to Arthur Griffith. He said, these men, they're soldiers. They will accept orders. They know what they know what they are, and they're, they're pledged to Dáil Éireann, so they will follow an instruction from Dáil Éireann. And Griffith almost immediately responded and wrote to the Lord Mayor Cork. And basically, what he was saying was, and it's up on the board behind us even. I'm of the opinion that our countrymen in Cork Jail have sufficiently proved their de devotion and fidelity and that they should now, as they were prepared to die for Ireland, they should prepare to live for <coughs> The Lord Mayor, on receipt of the letter, immediately proceeded to the jail, consulted with the prisoners, <coughs> uh, the relatives, conducted a plebiscite, a ballot, and a majority was in favour of ending the hunger strike. And literally, without any ado, it finished. And immediately the doctors moved in and took over. <coughs> so uh, Dublin Castle was able to report that the <coughs> prisoners in Cork Jail, night, on the night after doing 94 days of hunger strike, they resumed taking nourishment to treat a day. And they all took their first meal under the direction of the medical officers of the jail. It is thought that with careful treatment, they will ultimately make a good recovery. And no, none of them had any unfavourable symptoms after the first meal. And this was a, a fairly big assumption that uh, they would all survive because, you know, they were literally skin and bone. Nevertheless, um, their care proceeded. Um, the doctors are attending. Uh, a little food uh, has been administered. With great difficulty, they were able to partake of it. They were in a very low state, only very small quantities of nourishment. And they would be fed small quantities of liquid, first of all. Now, later on, um, I'll move on fast now, on the 31st of December, uh, Eric Batscombe gave his, his last press briefing in Cork. And from the end of the hunger strike, uh, six or seven weeks had passed. And even through, in detail, in that press, in that press um, interview, uh, the condition of each of the prisoners, and also a detailed uh, account of their introduction back into feeding. Initially, it was liquids, baby food, uh, later on kind of broths and soup, then it was some fish and chicken. They were being fed six or seven times a day in very small amounts, gradually bringing them on into larger amounts and so on. But at the end of December, with his suitcase packed, and he <coughs> ready to go on the boat to England, he said that, um, their progress was as quick as it had been. It would be a long time, he said, before they'll be able to stand. It would be, in his opinion, without any experience such a strike, at least a year before they could have recovered to their previous condition. But he said all the prisoners are very cheerful and they're longing to get well. So that was possibly the final report of the hunger strike. Uh, but he did make a couple of other points. He said that he wanted to pay a tribute to the humane testament, the humane power taken by the governor of the prison, who Israeli mentioned Mr. King. 
And again, the medical officers and the whole management of the strike couldn't be possibly carried out except for the sympathy of the governor who felt in every possible way and was sympathetic not only with the patients and with their friends. Now you might expect that from a prison doctor to be praising the prison doctor, uh, praising prison governor. But actually, um, Tony Meenan, uh, uh, in his uh, interview with uh, Inchel McKeown uh, in, in, in Survivors, said exactly the same thing. He was full of praise for the prison staff and the prison governor for the way they handled it. They were able to realise that while he was doing his duty, he did it in the kindest and most sympathetic manner that it would have been possible for anyone to do. I was trying to find some, some more to finish up. I'll do some of all that. Uh, I went back to Arthur Griffith's letter to Father O'Leary, uh, replying to his suggestion. So he said that Terence McSweeney, Michael Fitzgerald and Joseph Murphy laid down their lives that the world might understand that those whom England advertises to be criminals are Irishmen whose patriotism is proof against torture and death. Their heroic sacrifice achieved the full result. The sacrifice which their nine comrades in Cork are equally prepared to make could not further emphasize it. So I think that is a very fitting way to sum up, if you like, what they went through and why they went through it. So just uh, as a final thing, uh, Conor Kenny, I think great credit to him, uh, has met all and organised all the, the, the relatives of the hunger strike and got photographs of uh, eight of the nine survivors and uh, has consented to me showing this today. And finally, I was uh, greatly privileged uh, to go on a trip out to Spike Island with the, um, the descendants and with the relatives of the nine surviving hunger strikers back in July, which was the most memorable day. So thank you very much. I've gone way over the time. Thank you, John, for, for an absolutely superb uh, presentation. And um, thank you, everybody, for your um, attention and forbearance. Um, I think that given the topic at hand, um, we should not be too worried about maybe delaying lunch by a minute or two. Um, I know that there are people who want to ask questions of the speakers and I'd like to allow time for that to happen. So maybe I could um, invite members of the audience to um, raise their hands if they'd like to and ask a question from the floor of, of John and John. And I see Connor is... Uh, just one. Uh, the four nuns, the bonds nuns. Uh, one of their names was Sister Antonio Rooney from Old Park in Tridi. When I went up today, I inquired about that, about the nuns. Uh, the nun was from Blarney that I was inquiring about. And all she was interested was, is Tom Kinney still playing? Oh, wait, was your <laughs> I, I would just like to, to thank uh, Deirdre and the Kilmory Museum and their colleagues and the two giants here as well for uh, the fabulous exhibition and the talks and it's because of people like this that these men will never be forgotten. They were forgotten. When I was doing the research there was nothing in Irish history because of the men like these and Royal Dwyer as well in the examiner at least they won't be forgotten again. And you can read all the details in the nine survivors and also in Deirdre's book. I think it's 94 days, isn't it? Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Any other questions? Anybody would like to ask? Maybe I've just one of John. John, we've been focusing on Cork and both Johns. What was there anything, what, what, what was the situation in relation to hundreds, hunger striking elsewhere in Ireland at the time? In terms of the scale of it, the intensity of it. I mean, there, there, the were, there were scores of hunger strikes. There had been scores of hunger strikes. There had been, as I said, there were 20 different hunger strikes for you, just Cork Men's Prison. But they pretty much end after this. There, you know, you get the, the big one. Um, in the Civil War, there are there are a couple of hunger strikes. The, the big one is Mary McSweeney uh, goes out on hunger strike in the Civil War, and that really worries the Free State government. 
Um, and I think Taylor Callahan also was one out as well, who's of this parish. Uh, and then there's the mass hunger strike in the in the Civil War. Three thousand Republican prisoners go out. Um, uh, three people die, including Dennis Berry of Cork City, and very controversially. Bishop Conlon refuses to give him a Catholic burial, uh, and that causes huge upset. And you know, a after having uh, excommunicated IRA fighters in the War of Independence, and also excommunicating them again in the Civil War, that denial of the of the of a Catholic burial that Dennis Berry was seen as that's kind of uh, he was really uh, always hugely unpopular as a result of that. So. Thank you, John. Yeah. Uh, just uh -huh. before he died, Terence McSweeney indicated that he thought the hunger strike shouldn't be used again. He, he thought it wasn't a good idea to use it again. Very interesting. Yeah, I mean, they, they, they and they, they maximized. I mean, they, they went out. They, they took, they took it as far as it could go, and then they realized afterwards that having done this, it'll just, it'll, they'll just have the same response, and they're uh, and diminished returns. Yeah, absolutely. Could I just thank Cotton yes. as well for his amazing talk last night? I talked with Brother and for his presence here today, the grandson of Tan Smith. I talked with Brother last night. Thank you. John, 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 I'm just interested in um, the way you, you were suggesting there that the reaction in the court jail, that the authorities and the medical profession and the system, they kind of worked. Uh, as well as they could within the bones of what rules they were obviously bound by. There was really a completely different response in Brixton, really, wasn't there? From the, you know, that from the word go, the, the attitudes and the responses to the Maximilian family was aggressive, really, as, as, and particularly as the strike went on. Whereas I just thought it was very interesting and okay, they'd be looking after one another, but Batiscombe was of a different thing altogether. It really fascinates me that he came to that from a different perspective, and he looks at the Governor King there as somebody who was bound by what he had to do. We might disagree with it, but he had to do what he did. But within, as far as he could, um, humanely. Whereas my, my take of reading some of the reports of Brixton was just, from day one, they were, you know, at loggerheads with each other, and it got worse. Well, they were, they were denied entry into the prison uh, yeah. towards the end, yeah. uh, except for Muriel. Yeah. Uh, the two yeah. sisters were, were barred, you know, yeah. Yeah. and uh, I, I think possibly uh, one of the, 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 the differences was <coughs> the, the prison chaplains involved, the Catholic chaplains, yeah. and the nuns, definitely. Yeah. But, uh, you know, even even by today's standards, you know, it's quite surprising that large numbers of the family were allowed to stay overnight in the prison, yeah. and, uh, you know, there was never any attempt to block uh, visits or anything like that. And I also thought it was very significant that it wasn't just the uh, prison doctor who was, was praising them, but that uh, Con Conneman, uh, yes. that he had only been involved in the early days of the strike before he was moved yeah. uh, across, but he came up straight and said, yes, they were very decent to us. But then there had also been one of the warders, a guy called Griffith, was considered obnoxious, and the IRA kidnapped him. Yeah. <laughs> and they care, and they kept him in custody yeah. throughout the duration of the hunger strike. Yeah. Yeah. So there was a yeah. so there was a, and, and also one of the one of the letters that Batiscombe uh, it says you should you should change your tone to the families. Yeah. And 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 then that and then that's when the, the, the nuns come in. Yeah. And then it seems like Batiscombe and Kirsten kind of back off yeah. and the nuns come in yeah. and then Kidnapping takes place, and, and and then everyone decides to step off a little bit, and then that's that, that's when you when everything kind of ste steadies in there. In, in the last four or five days before Charles McSweeney died, uh, his family wasn't allowed in, and he felt he was being threatened by the doctors and prison officers, and he he was really feared that if he went unconscious, they would be forced feeding him. So he was quite distressed in the last few days, yeah. which which yeah. they did, of course. Yeah. yeah. They did try to. Question here, and then you. John, you just emphasised that they were rebelling against the prison system there, and I was wondering why you kind of were emphasising that, and not that they were fighting against, like. The British government. Well, because they weren't. They they weren't. They didn't go on a trial for their release. I mean, the strike wasn't about them getting released from prison. The strike was about them getting tried. 
So like that was because it, it was a very specific. They had very specific demands, mm -hmm. and all these strikes they're they're making, and this is the whole reason you could you could have people go. They they didn't ex I, they didn't anticipate that they would strike to the death. They were willing to once it went down that line, but they didn't start off thinking it was going to end. It, they were going to go down all the way down the line. So what they were striking for was to be tried. Mm -hmm. And that's and then and then when the, and this is also the thing about you know then it becomes about uh, being tried or freed and that kind of clouds the whole issue and, and the 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 off ramps are taken off. One of the things from the British perspective was the British government was look, it was during August. Literally the entire British cabinet was on holiday and Lloyd George only jumps in. He's in Switzerland, and he announces there'll be no releases. Like this is like maybe day eight or day nine, and that's it. That locks them in, and then there's no mitigations or anything, and then they're just they're absolutely locked in, and that's how it ends up. Yeah. Thanks, John. Deirdre, did you want to ask a question? It was really more a comment. Um, when we were doing the research, one of the things which was very clear was that there was enormous variability in how individuals treated individual prisoners. So, for example, on some of the deportations, particular soldiers were very unpleasant, and others were much nicer. And, and particular prison governors were more or less unpleasant. So most of the convicted prisoners, in fact all of the convicted prisoners, were initially transferred to Wormwood Scrubs Prison in London where it was routine to force feed. Um, there were certainly threats to force feed in Winchester. Uh, so it was very variable. And you also had one of the doctors on one of the deportations, the IRA wanted to assassinate, he was so nasty. And Terence McSweeney said, you cannot kill a doctor. So you have these quite complex back and forths um, about these I, I don't want to keep everyone too long, but there was also there's a massive prison escape <laughs> attempt in March, where they used the prison the hunger strikers to seize control of the prison. So it's like a hundred IRA guys uh, sweep in. They put ladders up against the extern. They occupy everything around there. They have uh, they basically are going to do a mass escape, and they the the the, the local the curate. Um, Oh, what's his name? Who became who won? Who was in Dunkirk? Uh, Duggan. Duggan. Cannon Duggan yeah. smuggled in mallets, yeah, big hammers, right. and the and the and the hum, release hunger strikers or boys. They were supposed to knock unconscious the, the wards and then let guys out. And then there were IRA armed IRA guys on the prison walls, and it was going to be a mass escape. And the the prisoners, the one of the warders on strike had been a really sympathetic guy during the hunger strike. And they didn't want to knock him, essentially fracture his skull, mm -hmm. and so they tried to kind of, kind of sit on him, and he struggled and broke loose and, and called the alarm, and that ruined the whole escape. But basically, and, and the reason is these guys still had, they were still being treated, they still had free access in the prison infirmary, so that was the kind of thing. But the thing is, is as, you, as, you, as you said, said, it's like it's like they had a, a bond with that guard for going through the hunger strike. And they didn't feel comfortable just smashing his head in, and that basically gave that basically spoiled the whole mass escape. But it's about this idea of these human relationships that develop, and that's also with Batiscom and Pearson. They develop this 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 bond with the prisoners that's not there apparently, but that's kind of natural to all this as well. So perhaps I just thank John for setting the context so absolutely wonderfully, and and John here beside me for such a moving actually. Um, presentation, John. Thank you for for that insight and, and that moving sequence, which I think enlightens us all to to the human dimension uh, of all of this. In in, in in addition, obviously, to the political uh, context. So, and it all uh, complements beautifully the exhibition, which I encourage you to to to, to look at. You'll learn more again, um, and, and and of course, Deirdre's book. So we're going to reconvene at two fifteen, if that's okay. Can I ask you again to show your appreciation for the? Speaker?